Welcome to Building Wealthy Habits. This is a podcast featuring me, Randy Barkley, along with our team, Jeremiah Lee and Laura Lee. On this podcast, we share financial advice from our team of certified financial planners, which include a California licensed attorney, myself, an MBA professional, and a collective experience of over 40 years. All right. In this week's episode of Building Wealthy Habits, Jeremiah and I talk about topics, a checklist for those who have lost a loved one or are anticipating the loss of a loved one. And so the subjects that we discuss are for those who might have lost a spouse, a parent, or another close family member. It might also be for someone you know or yourself who's anticipating the loss of a loved one. At times we can anticipate whether it's an aging parent or a loved one who's dealing with a long-term illness. And so the practical aspects of this episode address uh, account rollovers. We talk about um, estate planning documents, life insurance claims, settling the final estate, which includes liabilities, both short-term and long-term. And so we kind of go over a practical list, a checklist, if you will, of what to do following the death of a loved one. And then we end the episode by talking about the importance of support groups and counseling services and ultimately not walking the road of grief alone and the importance of having people surrounding you, not just your financial advisor or your CPA or other professionals in your life, but also those who are just helping you with the emotional support needed and not to minimize the importance of community, especially in that time of your life. We hope that you enjoy and find benefit listening to this episode or share it with friends who uh, would identify and benefit from some of these topics. There is such a trend these days, right? So I feel like with most of, I guess my friends, people that I hang out with, I notice that their beverage of choice is an accessory. It is legit accessory. Like it matches their outfit in the best case scenario. I think this is new. kind of a status symbol a little bit, don't you think? Yeah, you you have one. Others have one. It's that Stanley mug. I think you have one with you today. One choice. One choice. I think that's started a trend. I mean, they have they have revolutionized working out. You know, you could have the the classic uh, coffee cup. You know, the mug. You know, our clients get a. A mug when they come in. Very Um, classic. That was like when we were in the talk show setup for all of our viewers that are watching us. We're doing a different setup today. So when we were in more of like the talk show setup, I thought the mugs were really important. I like that. That's great. No, I I think water bottles are a great choice. I love the Nalgene's, like the big plastic ones because they hold so much. But your Stanley or whatever else you use holds a lot. I mean, people all have different preferences. Uh, uh, Some to hold water, right? I think it's great you're drinking water however you drink it. I know. You regularly tease me and the kids. I always have three beverages with me on a regular basis. I don't know why it has to be three, too. I mean, one is water. One's probably coffee. Yes, typically coffee. Mine is really cute today, actually. Yeah, that's a good one. It looks like it's a party cup, doesn't it? It's a party in a cup. (laughs) And it's very soft. I feel like I'm on like a product infomercial. Well, you're in your third... (laughs) Your Amazon. I can put the link in the show notes. <laughs> no, don't do that. We're not doing that. And then your third beverage is often like a, a salt water type hydrating water. I which do you, like you're my into. salty water. Yeah, because you work out and do those things and you appreciate uh, some salty water. But it's also kind of a protection because on a regular basis as we're leaving the house, I tell my kids, grab your water bottles, grab your water bottles. And you know what? If they don't, guess whose water bottle they want to drink from? That's right. Yours. And if it has salt water in it, they may not want to drink from it. They may not. <laughs> they have definitely learned the hard way. They go to That's take right. a big gulp and then they're like, oh, mom. <laughs> salt water got me again. When will I ever learn? I know. The thing about three beverages is you always have options. You do. Typically you the there's options. some sort of caffeinated item, hydration. And then the third, hey, something fun. Yeah, something fun. I like it. I no, like it, it sounds like I'm bringing like alcohol to like baseball practice. I'm not. You're not. Let's our listeners just know <laughs> that I'm not. <laughs> All right, why don't All you right. kick us off? Get us started. We have like really important things to talk about today. We did. So I think <laughs> let's just go ahead and dive in. Um, yeah, switching gears a little bit. We 
are um, we're talking to those who are either preparing or anticipating the loss of a loved one or who have most recently lost a loved one. So this could be a spouse. This could be a parent, um, close family member of yours. And we've talked on previous recordings about how important it is to really take time to grieve and not to jump into like action right away. A lot of people kind of feel this anxiety around what do I have to do next? And they feel like there's this immediate checklist that they have to get done. And I think more than once on this recording, we've said, really, it's not a time to make, especially don't make major decisions, but just take some time and grieve and do what you need to do emotionally, be with your family. And so this episode kind of starts where those ones left off, which is that now you have moved past kind of that initial shock of losing someone and you're starting to think about what is the list of things um, that need to happen. Um, specifically, we're talking about account rollovers, change of beneficiary. So this is kind of a checklist, but we're going to just talk about some highlights. So yeah, and this is the action items portion of it. I, I right, one hundred percent agree. Whenever someone loses a spouse or a really close loved one, we talk about you know the grieving process. We talk about um, you know there's no immediate action often because your life is planned. You have good structures in place, but there comes a point when you've you've processed some of the grieving and you're ready to dive in and to do something mm-hmm. and to get your life restructured. And that's what we're talking about today. So there is actually a little bit of energy um, ab- about this list um, because you're taking charge of finances often that you know, in a way that you weren't before. Whichever spouse it is, often spouses would share some part of the financial um, running of the household. And so mm-hmm. this moment is when one spouse is taking over everything. And so that's, that's, that's part of the, we have a checklist that we go through just to make sure we don't miss anything. It doesn't have to be a checklist, but there's just a number of items that, that, you have opportunities and you also have things that need to get done. Right. I like that word that you used as energy because the goal here is to really equip you with the information that you need. You might be stepping into a more independent role of managing finances, especially if it was the loss of a spouse. If it was the loss of a parent, it might be something where you're stepping into a situation that you actually don't know a lot about. You maybe don't know how prepared your parents were in terms of estate planning, etc. So we want to equip and energize you to be able to get done what needs to be done and and for you to feel that confidence that you've you've checked everything off the list. So we're going to get a little bit detailed, but hopefully just really the breadth, like check off all the things that need to be considered. So let's go ahead and dive in. Do you want to get us started? Sure. Uh, The first one we have is debts and liabilities. And this is one I see when someone first uh, has lost a loved one, they then need to look around and say, okay, what, what needs to be paid? Uh, we, we have some assets. We're in the process of gathering assets, but getting a good list of short-term debts, you know, things like maybe mm-hmm. a mortgage or a credit card, and then longer-term debts to say, hey, did, was there some school debt? Was there um, a, a car loan? You know, and, and kind of inventorying those and walking through them. All those are different. We've had some students w- or some clients where they will have some student debt, and when they pass away, that debt will actually kind of die with them. There's right. other things like a mortgage that survives and continues on for the spouse. But understanding the debts, the liabilities, even the, like I said, the short term of, you know, do you need you know $10,000 this week so you can pay some things there? That, that's really important to know. And really cash important flow. to together. Yeah, I think what you're referring to is cash flow and how important that is right away. What are your immediate needs? But I think in terms of resolving someone's estate, any debt that was taken in their name is going to be resolved probably within the year or so of their death. Um, And it's not always bad news. You know, it's not always that something is payable immediately. Like in the case of education debt, we have a client who the, um, the wife had taken out the college debt for the child and it was a significant amount of debt. And at the time of her passing, it's all forgiven. So you think about the, um, I guess, gift. Obviously, it wasn't a gift to have her mom pass away. So I say that um, carefully, but the gift that she's been alleviated of that education debt that she would have otherwise had to have pay off, paid off. Yeah. yeah, there's opportunities. And like you said, some have to be paid, some have to be restructured and, and just identifying them and dealing with them is a, is a key piece in my mind, mm-hmm. um, getting a good list. And I think to be proactive with these um, these organizations, banks, companies, whatever, to say you have full intention to pay off any outstanding liabilities. Because the worst case scenario is when they start 
chasing you. Um, and that's not a great feeling to have, um, or they contact credit agencies or et cetera, et cetera. So we want to avoid all that that can turn into a big mess. And you want to be proactive in contacting any agencies that have outstanding liabilities, both short and long term. Yeah, so. that's great. Well, let's talk about the next one, which are some rollover options. And um, primarily what we're talking about here is retirement accounts, but there might be some other accounts um, where the deceased person has held them in their name, but you are the first beneficiary. You're the primary beneficiary. So in the case of retirement accounts, we're talking about 401ks, IRAs. Um, or it was an investment retirement account. And so what does that process look like when somebody passes away? How do we start rolling over that account to the person's name? Yeah, this, this is a, a good one to come and work with a professional because the rules have all changed. Um, you know, as of 2020, prior, prior to 2020, we had some different rules of who could do what with retirement accounts. And, and now as we go forward past 2020, uh, the rules are a little different. So if you're a spouse, if your spouse passes away, the, the main thing that the most people will opt to do, there's a few options, but the, the primary one that people will see is, is they'll roll over what was their deceased spouse's account into their own name. So it becomes their account. So it goes from their spouses, um, whether there's a 401k or an IRA, it rolls over now to their account and it's based on, on their lifetime now, which is, mm -hmm. which is great. It gives them full control, gives them full access to those assets. Um, if, if it was a parent, it's, it's a whole different world and we won't get into that today because it's, it's somewhat complicated. Um, but wh whoever you're receiving that from, rolling it over to, into your name is often the, the path you'll be doing. There are mm -hmm. some situations where you want to leave it in the existing decedent's name. Um, and, and there's some reasons why you might want to do that, um, especially if they were like a younger spouse that passed away unexpectedly. Uh, but, but often, I'd say even 90% of the time, when it's two spouses, you're going to be rolling over that account into your name. And, and that's really paperwork. I mean, it, it's, it's not overly complicated other than you know, there's filing a certain amount of forms with whatever custodian is, is custodians holding that and you get it all transferred over. And that's I mean, it's a big part of what our office does and support, but any sort of financial advisor should be able to help you through, you know, creating your own account and then rolling that into it. And what's important to remember here is um, timeline. Um, like you said, some of the rules have been updated. And so depending on your relationship to the deceased person, their, uh, that account rollover might be time stamped. So for example, you might have exactly 10 years to liquidate that account to yours or to another person's uh, from the date of their death, or you might have five years. So it just depends. Yeah. Also, if the deceased person was already receiving what they call required minimum distribution. So if it was a retirement account, they were of the age where they were already receiving RMDs, and then they pass away, there is another calculation that they do depending on, again, your relationship to the decedent. So um, yeah, there's a lot of rules, a lot of in and outs and some updates that have been made to those rules. So when it comes to account rollovers, you definitely want to start expediting the process and just be aware that there might be some uh, specific timeline uh, timelines that apply to mm -hmm. rolling over the account. Yeah. And the, and the, the end of the day, the whole I mean, there's a number of items here, but the, the general concept is that you're moving into these assets to become yours, whether they're titled differently or held in different accounts. And that's one piece of these assets are all kind of becoming yours. Yeah. Uh, the next yeah. one we'll, we'll talk about um, is estate planning. Uh, th this is an interesting one that most people don't think of estate planning, but it really depends, again, how your estate is, is, is structured. You know, I knew you'd want to talk about this one because I know. I know. of your my, background. My, yeah, my background, I'm an attorney, and I, I have helped many people structure their estates. We've helped people administer their estates. So after someone passes away, we help the trust then continue going and administer it going forward. And it, it, it's interesting, you know, 20 years ago, the options that people had is they would do what's called an AB trust. And you don't need to, mm -hmm. you know, can Google that. You don't need to go deep into that. But basically, it would put, take half the assets and lock them away in what would they call the bypass trust. And the other half would go into the survivor's trust. And the survivor could do anything they want with the survivor's trust. They could amend it. They can update it. But that bypass trust often was structured in a way that kind of locked it away and didn't give them um, very many options to amend it. And at first it seemed great, but often you'll go down the road and realize, hey, this, this child who we named as our successor trustee who's going to take over, they're no longer the best choice. And it can tie the hands of someone. So often... I mean, there's every family is a little different, but often I'll see people who will, when one spouse passes away, they'll give the survivor kind of full control to do anything mm -hmm. they'd like to do with all the funds. And in a, in a mixed family, you know, 
kids from a prior marriage or a marriage later in life, that often isn't the right structure, but for some families it, it can be. And, and so for anyone, when someone passes away, you want to look at your estate planning documents and understand what the structure is, what, what was planned, what needs to happen now to either split up the assets or amend right. things or adjust things. Um, in an ideal world, you would know exactly where that will or trust exists or who you need to contact to get access to it. Um, but in general, if we're talking about the person who's listening, how often should they revisit their estate plan? You know, take a look at that will. Who did we name as, you know, guardianship for, you know, X, Y, or Z? Where are those assets supposed to transfer? So how yeah. often should they revisit? Yeah, I mean, if you think about that, how wonderful if all that was up to date. Um, if, if someone passes away and you know, oh, all that stuff was just re recently updated, it's all current. I always encourage people five years that they mm -hmm. should look at their trust. And if everything still makes sense, just put it back on the shelf. No problem. If something needs a change, it's a great opportunity to do some sort of an update um, with your attorney to walk through. And, and, and often when someone does pass away, the, the, the call, once you start looking at the estate planning items, is to call the attorney that wrote it. That, that's often the easiest. If they wrote it a long time ago, then maybe they're still not not still practicing or they've passed away. There's a we're in here in Riverside, Southern California. There's an attorney office that they don't do any estate um, administration. They'll help you write the will, but they won't help you after someone passes away. Um, the other firms they do all of it. They'll help you write mm -hmm. the, the the initial estate plan. They'll help you administer it. They'll go through probate if you need to. Um, so often the first call is to the attorney who wrote it. And if they're able to assist and you want them to assist, wonderful. If not, it would be finding a new attorney to kind of guide you mm -hmm. through that process. And, and our office does that for clients. Um, this is where I would say that match of financial planning and having the legal both together in the same office can be really helpful, can serve a situation in a unique way because we here at Tricord have been on both sides where our client is the one who's aging or it could be a spouse who's suffering kind of a long-term illness. And a lot of times having these conversations is really delicate and it can be really sensitive. And so sometimes our role in that conversation is just being a third party. Yeah. At times we have to prompt some of these hard questions, but a lot of times it's just a matter of making the appointment and having, uh, let's say if it's the next generation come sit in with their aging parent in a meeting and let's review these documents together and ask questions and what does that mean and what if this and so we can kind of address all those things at one time um and so again it's not something every day that we wake up you know those things that are certain death and taxes you know there aren't things that we want to think about every day but there are going to be situations in our life that bring them to our attention so if you're a regular client of tricord we do bring this up on occasion during our progress appointments not at every single progress appointment but like you said there's kind of a cadence uh, maybe every few years that we want to just revisit what's the content in these documents has anything changed in your life uh, that needs that needs updating yeah and that one of my favorites is when I, I love your comment of saying when the finance and the, the legal overlap, and that's a lot of where we live. That's a lot of what we do because we're, we're doing both that. But when some families you can have, we, we call a family meeting, but when you have multi-generational discussions about um, finances, about estate planning, about structures, uh, majority of families probably are not able to do that. You know, they're not mm -hmm. able to have a healthy conversation about money. However, we have a lot of clients that we've, just like you said, we will have work through that conversation and talk multi-generational transitions of wealth. And it, it's been really productive to say we as a, you know, a grandparent generation really want to support everything. And how do we best benefit the parent generation that is trying to raise the grandchild your generation mm -hmm. know, and as that passes down. So um, it, it's a joy when we get to do those types of meetings and those kind of multi-generational planning. It, it's really powerful. Um, right. It's not for everybody. It's not possible with everybody, but it is powerful when we can do it. Yeah. And it's one of the parts of this business that I love so much. Like these conversations can be very personal um, and even intimate and they can be sometimes difficult. And so navigating that conversation in a productive way, but one that can benefit everybody sitting around the table, you know, that's really our goal. Um, and obviously to serve our clients as best as we can in these situations. And this kind of tees up the next we talked about er what are the two things that are certain in life, death and taxes? And yeah. so we get questions on a regular basis. Well, what taxes am I going to have to pay? You know, if I've rolled over this giant retirement account, let's say it's a giant retirement account, I've rolled over this account of any size, what taxes do I have to pay? And 
there's again a variety of different rules. This is a great another opportunity to consult with a professional because mm-hmm. not all the rules are um, the same. Some have been updated. I'm just going to say a general rule of thumb. If the money that was put into the account was after tax money, then most likely when you withdraw the funds from that qualified account, it will not be taxed. On the other, on the other hand, if funds put into a qualified account were pre-tax money, so, so we're talking about like 401ks and things like that, then when you go to withdraw the funds on the other side, you will most likely have to pay the tax. So it doesn't mean that you get to avoid all tax. You just have to remember Uncle Sam likes to get paid. He either just gets paid up front or he gets paid at the end. So that's just a general rule of thumb that I like to remember. Yeah, no, that, that's a great one. And I think the other aspect that I have a number of clients that they will anticipate that everything they're inheriting is going to be taxable. They've heard about a death tax. Um, they they know it's large. And so they expect whatever they receive, there's a massive amount going out to taxes. And that is true in very large estates. But right now, an individual, it, it's roughly $12 million is the uh, exemption from the estate mm-hmm. tax. So you have a married couple. It, it's $24, 25000000 million or so that they are exempt from estate taxes. So if, if there is, if, if a couple out there is listening to this and you think, oh, well, add everything up and yeah, we're way under 25 million, well then your, your heirs, when you, when you pass on, are probably not gonna have to pay any sort of estate tax. The estate tax is a 40% bite. It's a very big bite. I was going to say, it's a, it's a heavy, you want to avoid estate tax as best as possible. Yeah. If you can, you want to avoid it. It's 40% significant amount. Yeah. So the majority of folks who, uh, don't have estates that are, you know, 25 million plus, it's not that big of a deal. It's fairly easy. Mm-hmm. People who are higher than that, you're 25, 50, hundred million. That's when kind of that complex estate planning comes into play. Um, and my background when I was working solely at a law firm, we would do it. That, that was the world that we we're working in. We're doing irrevocable trusts. We're moving assets around, um, to kind of minimize that estate tax. Um, but for the majority of people, um, it, because the exemptions are so high, it, they don't have to worry about it. Those exemptions are set to sunset in 2025. And so if, mm-hmm. if, if, the, if Congress doesn't extend that, then those numbers will come down. And it's a good, good moment to reevaluate if something different needs to be done in your estate. Uh, but Congress may extend those, uh, which many yep. people would appreciate. Yeah, it's definitely a moment that we'll be paying attention because it could have a large impact on many of our clients. clients. And so, um, again, good opportunity to consult with a professional. I don't know how many listeners out there are regularly keeping updated on new tax laws (laughs) and codes. And that's what we're here for. Make all this stuff exciting. That's right. (laughs) One other thing I'll I'll mention, and most people, uh, I'm surprised how many people have not heard of this before, but when someone passes away, um, any sort of real estate or stocks that they, they purchased during their lifetime gets what's called a step up in basis. So if, if someone bought a home for 300000 and they uh, have that home and they've had it for years and now it's worth um, double, we'll say 600000 Well, if they were to sell it during their lifetime, it was a rental property, they're going to have to pay taxes on that growth. That, that's normal um, how, I, how the IRS rules work. But the time of their death, that cost basis goes from about 300000 they paid all the way up to the fair market value of 600000 so whoever inherits it very likely has zero taxes related to growth of that asset. And so when, when people are inheriting properties or inheriting stock accounts, often when we're, we're talking through what this is going to look like, they have this moment, this aha moment where they're amazed that all these taxes their parents might have had, they've now kind of dissipated um, at the time of their death. And so holding right. assets at someone's death and inheriting them from your parents or from even from a mm-hmm. spouse is a really wonderful tax advantage moment. Mm-hmm. to receive those. So so we shouldn't uh, leave the topic of taxes without recommending that this is a moment when you want to get in touch with your CPA or whoever it is that you work with that does your taxes. You're going to want to inform them of the death of your loved one. And there is a final estate tax form that needs to be filed in the year of their death. And so this is where this final accounting will come together. And so having a plan in advance is ideal. But even if you don't have a plan in advance, again, I would consult with a professional, including your CPA. And of course, your financial advisor as well. So let's roll on to insurance claims. If the deceased person had a life insurance policy and you were named as the primary beneficiary, let's talk about the steps that you take to claim the benefit. And at the beginning of this podcast, we started to talk about uh, liquidity needs. Uh, The estate itself might need cash in order to settle some of those short or long-term liabilities. This is where one of the ways that life insurance can be 
really beneficial. And so sometimes this moves up in the priority list. Uh, We talked in an earlier segment too about obtaining multiple copies of a death certificate. This would be a case scenario where you contact the life insurance company uh, of which that holds the policy of the deceased person. You submit a death certificate claim so that you then are eligible to receive the payout from that policy. Yeah. And often the way this, this structure works is you're really just notifying the insurance company initially. Um, and if, if you're not sure who the beneficiaries are, they sometimes won't even tell you. you know, it, it can be confidential information. So often you notify whoever the insurance company is by sending a death certificate, notifying them of the death. They will then turn around and send out the, the beneficiary claim forms to the appropriate parties. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if, if that's you, <laughs> you'll, you'll get it in the mail and, and you'll be able to fill it out. If, it, if it's not you, if they name someone else as a beneficiary, they also will receive claims. And then you fill out the claim and you, and you file in. And again, it, it, it's paperwork. It, it's important to get it right. Sometimes there's options of how you receive those benefits. And you want to make sure those are um, well selected for your situation. Uh, but, but insurance. What about taxes? Do you have to pay taxes on life insurance proceeds? Drum roll, please. Often not. <laughs> it depends is, is the answer you're always going to get. Always. But, it depends. That's but right. generally uh, speaking, life insurance proceeds are not taxable. They're not taxed. So if, if a loved one had a $500,000 life insurance policy and they pass away, again, it depends a little bit on how it's structured, but very likely that $500,000 will come to the beneficiary without any sort of taxes or reductions, which mm-hmm. is, is a wonderful benefit for, especially if that came into a trust or to an estate and they're having to deal with, you know, managing properties, keeping them going, paying mortgages, any sort of other debts. If there's this infusion of capital, uh, of cash, it really makes things a lot easier. And, and life insurance, I wouldn't say they're fast, but they're also not that slow either. Once you file a claim, um, I felt the appropriate form and submit it, the payment is usually fairly forthcoming. Um, again, there's all sorts of situations. So again, you want to have a plan be- in place before you get those proceeds because it could happen fairly quickly. quickly. And it's a benefit to the estate um, as you go forward. Mm-hmm. So we need to kind of wrap up this topic. I just looked at the time and there's one last uh, very important topic that I want to make sure we have time for. But just real quickly to kind of put an end cap to this idea of account rollovers and a checklist after the death of a loved one. The last thing we want to look at is updating beneficiaries. So if you were the primary beneficiary now of that life insurance policy or the health care coverage that you had, just in general, any other uh, uh, accounts that you might hold where you were named as the primary beneficiary, you want to walk through a checklist to make sure you now update uh, those beneficiaries to someone else. So if it's an account that you've inherited, you no longer are the primary beneficiary. You can name another uh, beneficiary of that account because you are now the account holder. Yep. Anything to add to that? No, often when doing estate planning, people want to have all these contingencies of what if this and what if this, and let's automatically make it do this. And this is a, a really practical moment to say, well, if this person passes away, the survivor, the survivor will then take multiple steps to update things going mm-hmm. forward. And then, mm-hmm. so this is a good moment to review all sorts of things and make the appropriate updates for the next generation. Yeah. So just in the last couple of minutes, I wanted to touch on this topic um, of support groups. Um, it, you know, you think here I'm listening to some financial advisors talk about what checklist I need to do after someone I love has passed away. But we really want to focus on the heart of the situation as well. And so I want to end with uh, just this topic of support groups or counseling. Um, the point being that. Uh, this journey that you are about to embark after the loss of a loved one uh, should not be done alone. And there is such a benefit to community. And so, yes, our role is a financial advisor, but I like to emphasize personal financial advisor. Uh, We want to come alongside our clients and, and recommend different resources for them. Sometimes it's within a company. I um, had a chance to do some research prior to this recording and, and look up some resources that are available. There's some excellent online resources, one called Grief Share, which has been around for many years and has uh, support and counseling services, support groups and counseling services by region. So you can look up by zip code what's available in your area. Another one that is not just for those who have lost a loved one, but it's called Meetup. And I actually heard about this app from a friend of mine, a mom with young kids that had just moved to a brand new city um, and didn't know anyone. And so Meetup was a way to search for 
different groups or other people that were looking to connect that maybe had a similar interest or profile. So it's not a dating app. That <laughs> is not the goal. It's just other individuals that want to meet up to make connection. And I know sometimes taking that first step can be difficult. So in the case of grief share or meetup or whatever it is, we encourage you bringing someone along. If you have a friend or another loved one who would come with you, I think sometimes just taking that next step becomes a little bit easier. Yep. But the goal is not to do it alone. And there's such a benefit we see in those that have a community around them, especially when they're going through something as complicated and as difficult as losing a loved one can be. That's great. Uh, that's, that's great advice. I think uh, losing a loved one is not a one-time event. Uh, the event happens, but the grief and the memories and the celebration of that life continue. And we have many clients who on the anniversary of their, their spouse's passing or someone else's passing, um, it, it's, it's a meaningful moment again every year um, and multiple times throughout the year. So, uh, All right. Well, that comes to the end of our list for now. Thank you so much to our listeners. We have a few more things to let you know about before we go. Podcast reviews really help us to serve more people and get this information into the hands of people who need it. Please leave us a review. Even if it's not five stars, we welcome the feedback. And we invite you to let us know what topics you would like to hear more about or what would benefit the people in your life who are closest to you. We have more resources online as well. They're designed to help you share this information easily with the people in your life. To access them, please visit tricordadvisors.com. Often we hear from clients that they wish they would have talked to us sooner. If that's you, we would be thrilled to see how financial planning can benefit your life. Email us at contact at tricordadvisors.com or just click the link in the show notes. This show was produced by Graham Gardner at Model FA. Find out more about how to create a podcast for your financial planning business by visiting modelfa.com. Look, we love creating content that's useful, resourceful, and maybe even a little entertaining. We want to make this mega universe of financial topics and advice applicable and helpful for your life. And always remember, at Tricord Advisors, we are your future's best ally. Until next week, folks, may you grow in wisdom and knowledge. Thank you for listening. <laughs>